This is the official EFL podcast with Mark Clement. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the official EFL podcast with me, Mark Clement. And first things first, congratulations to Sheffield United, who after a magnificent season, perhaps ever so slightly overshadowed by Burnley, are back in the Premier League too. Six months ago, this man's new team had similar hopes. These boys start believing, start trusting me, start coming together a little bit more and uh... And the trip to Stoke, I think, is going to be a it's going to be a good one for us. We'll round up the best of the best of the annual EFL awards. I'm sorry, I'm humbled, I'm proud, I'm honoured um, to get recognition for a career that, listen, as a five-year-old, I just wanted to play football. I wanted to score goals. I wanted to make people laugh, you know. Um, and to be able to get recognition, listen, it's humbling. And next season, the EFL will sparkle like Tinseltown. At first, you stand back and you're like, me? Why, why, why would you want a photo with me? But obviously, with everything that's gone on at the club after the documentary and all the success we've had this season and playing as well as they have done, then that, that's only going to be natural. And I've just having to be honest, I should be privileged to be in that position. It's the official EFL podcast. Was there a more surprising result last weekend than in the Skybet Championship and Queen's Park Rangers, inflicting a first home defeat of the season on champions elect Burnley? It was only QPR's second win in 21 matches and a second in charge for Gareth Ainsworth. And in terms of the opposition, now this is a bit bittersweet just to get this out of the way, Gareth, isn't it? Because on the one hand, as a Blackburn fan, you inflicted that defeat on the deadly rivals. On the other hand, mate, you handed it to them to go and seal the title at Ewood Park (laughs) midweek. Absolutely devastated, Clem. Uh, How are you doing, mate? It's nice to talk to you. But yeah, that was... uh, that was um, a real bittersweet moment. I, honestly, all I can say is that I did my bit, Blackburn, um, and and you let me down um, the other night because uh, I was... And, and do you know what? The goal that Benson scored is identical to the one he scored against QPR. I can't believe they didn't they didn't know not to show him on his left foot. Cause, uh, but it was, yeah, it was a brilliant Saturday. Absolutely brilliant. And the boys and the way, the nature of it all, Clem, was just super. But... Yeah, on uh, on Tuesday evening, watching uh, watching the Clarets invade Ewood Park and and celebrate lifting the trophy wasn't nice for me because I am a I'm a true Blackburn fan, been there years and years, and uh, and that's not a nice thing to see. But um, I'm sure that Blackburn will make the playoffs and uh, and can give a good count of ourselves there. Yeah, but well, I, but and you did. You you are also at pains to stress that at least you prevented Blackburn having to give Burnley the guard of honour, which is oh. traditional for any teams once they've won the title. That anybody they face thereafter in the remaining games have to stand there and applaud them on the pitch. So at least you, at least the Blackburn fans didn't have to do that at Ewood Park. Do you think they would have done that? Do you think that would Arsenal do it for Tottenham, or vice versa? You know. Do you know what? Even through the bitterest rivalries of football, I still think some of those longer-term traditions remain. And if we start to strip them out just because of something as piffling as a little rivalry, then what is the game coming Piffling? To? Come on, it's Burnley. I, I did it to be <laughs> provocative, mate. Uh, and, and actually, if we might just finish that chat, I love... Of all the things that Vincent Company has done this season, and a lot of people are arguing they are the best team to grace the championship since it, since it became that and the rebrand branding of the second tier. I love the fact that even in his post match, he was saying how proud he was of winning the title and everything, but also showed an implicit understanding of the derby rivalries, which just goes to show how he's taken Burnley into his heart. Yeah, I can understand that as well, as as much as it pains me. But um Enthusiasm, man. <laughs> Come on, where's your energy? Where's you know your passion? You know what? He didn't have a beer with me after the game. Craig Bellamy invited me in. I know I know Bellas from a long time ago. And Vincent was busy, obviously, with loads of press and everything. But the uh the mark of the man is he sent me a text on Sunday morning saying, Fantastic result, Gareth. Well played. Shame I didn't catch up with you. Um so Massive respect for Vincent. Um, yeah, it's Burnley. I'll have to accept it, but um, we can move on now, Clem, and we can talk about other things. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we're going to do. The atmosphere on the coach leaving Turf Moor 
I mean, after all the pressure, strain, scrutiny, poking with a big stick that you've had over the last few weeks, and we're not for one second saying that you'd, you'd done that this season, but the sense of momentary relief and jubilation and joy must have been absolutely huge, was it not? Yeah, yeah, honestly. Kind of, it was, it was um, I don't mind admitting this, but um, in all my management career, I think the, the days leading up to the Norwich game, so the game before Burnley, um, were the, probably the most pressure days I've, I've had in management. I really, I really saying that now because this is QPR. This is a club that I came back to help, and uh, and I thought I'd get a bit of grace, and and the fans will be okay with me. But you know what? They care so much. It's their football club. It doesn't matter who's in charge. We've got to get the results. And and after the the defeat against Coventry. Um, it, it 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 was a bad game. That it was a bad day for us, and uh, and they they suddenly sort of not turned against me, but the despair was felt. I felt the pressure. The lads were looking at me, thinking, "How are we going to get out of this?" We dropped one place above the the, the line, and uh, and I think that that um, that build up to the Norwich game, I was thinking we just lost three 0 to Coventry. We, we, you know, after a decent result at, at West Brom, it, it looked like we turned the corner again, just like we had at Watford a few weeks before. But no, it didn't happen, and we lost again. And so that that Norwich game at home, and it's Norwich crying out loud. There's decent side just off the players. I'm thinking, what if we get beat here four 0 tonight? What if something happens like that? I, I could be in some serious trouble. This, this is this is cute. Yeah, I know the passion that these football fans have is ridiculous. Wickham are great, right? Wickham are great, but they're not. Horrible when you lose, and they're not incredible when you win. They're just fans who come down there and they get behind your team. And you know, they're they're, they're quite um, what you'd expect from Wickham fans. A lot sort of you know that they can accept not being the best. They can accept as long as people try. That's it. QPR. Oh my God, that they, they have this expectation. They want they want success. They've got these huge rivals rivalries in London and. And that really got to me, you know. And uh, and so a one-one against Norwich was a massive relief. Never mind a two-one against Burnley, but I didn't see that one coming. Um, we prepared really well. Um, I did a lot of uh, work mentally on this game to go into this game and told the boys about how they may take a little bit of punishment um, for quite some time because they're the best team in the league by a mile. But wait for your opportunities, take your chances, wait for those moments, and uh, and they certainly did. And uh, and. The nature of it now tells me that these boys start believing, start trusting me, start coming together a little bit more, and uh, and the trip to Stoke I think is going to be a it's going to be a good one for us. Were the boys having you until um, that win? Do you know what? Half yes, half no. I've got you've got in society claim you've got these you've got boys who'll have anyone. They'll grab all of you and go. You know what? I'll go for this. I'll go with this guy because he seems a good guy and a good. But some of them need a little bit more. Some of them need some success and some of them need some verification that what we're doing is right. It's not all, yeah, I come in with super energy. I come in with a different look. I come in, I'm different to a lot of managers. People know that. But um, you can't keep doing those things if you don't get results, if you don't back it up. And, and you can't fluke results either. You've got to tell the boys how they're going to get the results. And when it comes true and when, it, when they see it happening, they feel it happening, that's when you get them. And, and I said this to somebody yesterday. Um, I had a meeting with a couple of our owners yesterday and they said I was the squad, I, I was things. And I, and I said, you know what? I said, when I walked in on the first day, I probably, I probably had two of them out of 25. I probably had two of them. And that's just because the, the people they are, you know, they'll invest into me and go, yes, I mean, I'll do it. Like, like your soldiers, they'll be there. Yeah. I think yesterday I had a meeting with the boys after Burnley and we showed them what they'd done at Burnley. We showed them how they did it. And I looked around the room and I thought, you know what? I probably... I probably only haven't got two now. I've probably got everyone else except two, you know, and there's probably a couple who are always going to be like that. They take even more, a little bit sceptical and, and they're not playing at the moment. So they're probably just not 100% with me, but everyone else is. And the change, honestly, Clem, has been phenomenal. So I'd say the boys were having me as a person. They know I'm a good guy. They know I'm not an idiot and I've got their backs. But whether they were having me tactically as a football manager in the championship remains to be seen. But I'm saying now, definitely, they, they saw something in, in me and my staff that we, we told them what was going to happen and it worked and it happened. And it was like, we've got them, we've grasped them. And it's it's tough, you know, it really is tough. But um, I'm really pleased that the, the nature of the, the win was the way it was and, and what we told them would happen and did happen. And, and they took their moments. And uh, 
So now I can safely say I've, I've, I feel it. I feel it when I walk in the room. I've got boys, we're going to do this. And they're like, yes, we're going to do that. And that's, that's a great place to be as a manager. You said how different you were, very authentic, your appearance, your demeanor on the touchline and things. Do You know, that stuff, being that genuine is good when things are going well. When things are not going well, people start to use being different yeah, as yeah. a reason to have a, a, a sort of a, a jipe at you, if that is a word. Um, yeah. <laughs> did, did you in any way... Was there any self doubt in there? Did you remote? I'm not saying suggesting you'd suddenly cut your hair off and uh, stop wearing your leather jacket, but do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, you're yeah, a yeah. human being. You're a yeah, human being that's had enormous success in the decade you spent at Wickham, but you find yourself on a much bigger stage at a club where you spent was it seven years or eight years you spent? Know, as a about seven and a half years, yeah, right in the middle, yes. So yeah, yeah. So seven years, seven and a half years as a player, that must in moments of weakness or sadness at the plight cause you as a human being to occasionally question yourself have I got that right could I compromise on some bit no yeah so one of my big things Clem honestly is um staying consistent it really is because I think that just me I'm not saying that everyone should do this but it, it it's like if you tell a lie you've got to remember what your lies are because they'll trip you up. So you can't, I, I don't think you can change. I don't think you can try and be something else or just trying to accommodate something else because your way is just not working at the moment. My my big belief was um, keep being yourself, Gareth. And, and the amount of people, Clem, that text me, managers included, other managers, you know, and ex-managers and who text me and said, keep being yourself, keep believing. It was too many of them just to, not be a true statement. So, and, and I would do it anyway. I will stay consistent and I'll live and die. And I always have this saying that if I, and everyone has this, if you can look in the mirror at the end of the day and say, you gave everything, that's it. And if your best isn't good enough, then it doesn't matter because that was your best. You know, we'll try and make your best better. We'll try and improve that best. But if that was your best, so I, I said to myself, stay consistent, Gareth. Don't start changing. Don't go anywhere else because if the results do come, if they do come, you can't suddenly change back then. You can't go back to that person. You, you've got to stay that person that's come in the building straight away. And uh, I, I always go back to, um, <laughs> there's a there's a Kipling poem, isn't there? Um, the, the man one where it's, if you can keep your head um, about you when, when all others around you are losing theirs, I'm blaming it on you. And I kept, honestly, and this is crazy to say, and, and people might say, oh, he's just saying that rubbish because he wants to be profound. I honestly, I don't. I thought of that statement a couple of times and thought, you know, what? that's so true, you know, because everyone else was losing their head around me and they started to blame it on me. And I said, you know what? I'm going to stay above this. I'm going to stay above the parapet. I'll, you know, shoot the bullets at me because I'm going to stay this person and I'm not going to change. And I'm so lucky, happy, relieved that we finally got that result because I can go in tomorrow and be that same person that I was on that first day and, and, uh, and that's really important to me. I, 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 there is there is one other aspect to this, though, that I want to bring up with you. You did use the phrase damaged and fragile. Oh, yeah. And of the boys, that feels, I'm not, that feels quite extreme. I'm not sure in, in the, the decade you spent at Wickham, you've taken us that far inside the, the dressing room and and express those vulnerabilities. Maybe you did, and I missed it. But no. that felt quite extreme to do that. There was obviously a reason for that to take the pressure off them. Yeah, to, to take the pressure off them and to let the outside world know. I'm not saying they're a mess, these boys. I'm saying they're great boys. But wow, the season they've had, they've been damaged. They've been, they've been fragile, and I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised, you know, and, and even the strongest ones, you know, and, and there is a couple of strong boys in there, you know, Chris Martin, but he's only been there a few weeks. Sam Field, you know, the, these are captains. Ilias Chair has been a long-term sort of in and out with injuries this season. Lyndon Dykes had his illness. These are strong boys in there and they're, they're leaders, you know, um, but even they were probably a little bit fragile, you know, because the, 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 the group, the, the majority of the group was young, is young, I'm the fourth manager in charge this season, if you count Paul Hall's 
couple of games as caretaker manager. So that's four different styles of play, four different coaching techniques, um, four different personalities, and a, and a and a run of games that wow, you know, we, we bottom of the form table for thirty games ago, twenty five games ago, twenty games ago, ten games ago. I think, and and you know, I don't want to pat myself on the back. The last five, we've 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 finally come off the bottom of that table, you know, and, and started to climb the table a little bit. But they were, they'd been battered. They'd really been battered, and uh, just it, it was a different club when I walked in. It was a different club to what, what I left back in 2010, and it is going to be, you know, the Premier League and 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 a big change, and we've got this fantastic new training ground and lots of money to spend on players. But the feeling had gone. The the something was missing there, and I, and I am to I am to really bring that back, and, it, and it's nobody's fault. It's no fault of anybody. Um, people will all blame everyone else individual. It just happens sometimes. But I intend to bring that back and bring that that humility back to QPR because um, I think it's really important. But yeah, I felt for the boys. I really did. They were lower than a snake's belly, honestly, Clem. I've never known a morale like that when I walked in. Um, staff as well. But now, thankfully, everyone's starting to climb the ladder a little bit and it's important we do that. Yeah, well, I suppose the the contrast was extenuated by the fact that they were top of the table and handed over that that yeah. bat on to Burnley back in October, which rather leads me to a question about the fine lines in football. Because on the one hand, QPR's gone in one direction, but just those fine margins. I mean, I look at Tuba Akpom not even been allocated a Middlesbrough squad number at the start of the season. Crazy. That ends yeah. up with him being named the EFL's own championship player of the year. I look at Ipswich Town, who have now won 12 out of 13 as they stand on the verge of promotion, but had a heck of a blip before that run where they only won two in 10. I look at Gillingham for the first half of the season before the new owner came in. There were some significant signings, but suddenly took themselves to safety with lots of games to spare. Sometimes, is there a force at work that we we can't see, guys? Those <laughs> those fine lines between an extreme low and an extreme high. Yeah, it is really, really, it's really tough. It's really tough to sometimes work out why you do this and why teams do go through runs like this. There is reasons. There's gonna be there's gonna be reasons why it happens. But it's the the, the fine lines you talk about, Clem, are, are the the moments, and that's why the top teams are the top teams. Your Man City's. The fine lines, they always stay the right side of that fine line, you know, and the, and 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 that's that's the key. That's the key. But it's so, it's such a, it's such an array of things. It's not just the football. It's the mentality. It's that it's it's so much, honestly, Clement. And we're, we're in this country. It's brilliant because we have all these seasons. And when you start the season and it's August and all the sunshine, the pitches are fantastic. You've come out of pre-season. Everyone's short sleeves. No one's wearing gloves in training, no one's wearing hats in training. Brilliant, you're there. And then this is what happens in this country. You go into the winter months, the pitches get muddier, you pick up injuries because the pitches have changed the 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 feel of the pitches, hamstrings come and calves come. And then you get into the winter months, you have a massive ridiculous schedule over Christmas. We had the World Cup break this season as well, which I, I still think played a massive part in uh, in a lot of teams. What they did in the in the four weeks that they are off I think is huge. I think that should be looked into, seeing which teams did what and what worked, because that might happen again. But then you come into January, February, and you're absolutely windy, up against it, rain, dark nights, horrible. And now we're just coming out the other side again, back into that that start of the season bit. And that. so there's all these factors that come into it, and there's mental issues as well. There's there's transfer windows that come into things. It's all these factors that make you drop below that line. It's not just the fine margins, but it's getting all these little bits right, I think. And uh, and we definitely didn't get it right at QPR, 100%. And, uh, and people like Ipswich probably just put it right in the January window and look at them now and gone that way, you know? So, you know, it's uh, it's all different, but um, it's football management, it's football. That's why everyone loves the, the game in this country. And uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's brilliant, but being on the wrong end of it was, uh, was a... a a tough ask at the start of my uh, QPR tenor. Yeah, but but just to return to say Tuba Akpom, yeah. as well, sometimes it's just environment and then maybe what, a bit like life, one 
vital thing drops that stops yeah. the kind of meandering or stops the backwards momentum and sends it in the other direction. And then circumstances build and build. And before you know it, you're having the, the year of your yeah. life. A little bit of belief, Clem, honestly. Everyone's different. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of players before. They probably wouldn't change. Ah, well, no, I said they would because I, I consider myself mentally as strong as anyone. But when John Beck put his belief into me after I'd had my three years of, of here, there and everywhere, and John Beck went, I know what I'm going to work on with you. I'm, I'm going to work on your strengths. I'm going to make you this. I'm going to do that. The, the actual belief that you, you get from somebody is so important. And if Tuba Akpom has had belief put in him from Michael Carrick and just gone, you know, even even saying, what the hell are you doing in the reserves getting here? You're a first team, you're playing. Just that, and he scores, and then he scores again, and it's like, yeah, yeah, this is what, this is this mental side of the game for me is enormous. It's the biggest side of the game, uh, and, and believing someone can, can be so, so powerful. Yeah. For for the younger listeners to the official EFL podcast or viewers, uh, John Beck was Gareth's manager at Preston uh, during the Ice Age of football many, many And centuries. Cambridge and Lincoln. I signed for him three times. Like that. That's, that oh, was my one. Lord. Well, I was having to think on the spot because obviously <laughs> our guests, I never quite know what they're going to say about who. So the little cogs were whirring and I was trying to put two and two together but you have uh, dotted and crossed crossed that particular (laughs) equation. Your Skybet Championship fixtures this coming weekend. Need to tell you that obviously we do have games on every single day of the week. So uh, we're at the time we're recording this, we don't know the outcome of the Rotherham Cardiff game. But Friday night, Blackpool picked up two wins in three, but still in 23rd. They entertain Millwall, one of the playoff chasers, but just one league win in their last seven. In fact, three defeats in four. Then on Saturday, Burnley, the champions, go to Bristol City. Coventry, what a season they have had. One win in their first 10, remember, when they had all the problems with the pitch. They've won just about half their games since Swansea as well. If you're talking about ridiculous form, listen to this. One league win in their first seven, then five out of the next six, then five in the next 24, and then suddenly out of nowhere, Russ Martin's team have produced six wins in seven, so they're in the mix there as well. We've got two of the bottom three playing each other. Reading in 22nd player, bottom club, Wigan, who've now won their last two. Preston, another one of the playoff chasers, go to Sheffield United. Gareth's QPR are at Stoke, and then more news of playoff chasers. Sunderland at home to Watford. Two of the playoff chasers play each other in the late kickoff on Saturday. That's West Brom against Norwich. Then two of the relegation battlers play each other on Sunday. That is Cardiff against Huddersfield. And then we've got two games on May Day. Rotherham against Middlesbrough is a sort of bottom end, the top end clash. And then two more of the playoff chasers, Blackburn and Luton play each other how does it feel Gaz to live with the constant pressure regardless of which end of the table you are at the hopes and dreams of a whole community resting on your shoulders constantly being questioned you know desperately trying to keep a team up or desperately trying to get them out the top end of a table how how does a manager live with that strain and pressure it's tough, climate is tough, you know, and, it, and I've seen it intensified. So um, for anyone who wants to know the higher up you go, does it become tougher? I, I think so, yeah. I think the, the uh, so I never used to think, I, I used to think, well, you know, could, could uh, Mourinho come and manage Wickham and get the, the same results? The pressures are so different. The pressures are so, so different, honestly. Um, I think that the higher you go up, the more profile there is, the uh, the more pressure there is. Uh, so I, I massively respect these Premier League managers, huge, huge respect for them because um, the pressure does intensify. The money intensifies and, and, and the fan base is intensifying and the profile and the public image of all the... So it's huge. It really is huge. So um, living with it, Clem, um, just having things away from football has helped me. You know, the, the, the music's big, obviously, for me. Everyone knows that. It's not a secret anymore that I'm I'm a big lover of, of my music and, and putting a song on 
and people will probably, you know, identify with this. You put a song on from anywhere, from anywhere in your life, from any decade in your life, and it'll take you back there and you remember the good times. And, and that can really help at times. Uh, my, my children, for your children, realizing what's important in life and, and perspective as well, you know, for me, um, is talking to people who aren't in football, having mates, being mates with people who aren't footballers, who aren't football managers, going out. I go out on a Saturday night sometimes. Um, and, and by the way, I got somebody took a video of me the other week and posted it on Twitter and I got dogs abuse for being out after a loss. And that was my mate's 50th birthday. But that that comes with the job. But uh, but my mate was a landscape gardener. My other mate works as a, as a regional manager for Tesco's and things like that. So these people, mixing with these people, for me, is so important. It really is, you know, and they don't expect anything from me. I don't expect anything from them. We'll have a round each in the pub. We'll have a laugh. We'll have a chat about normal life. And uh, and I, I'd say that for me is really important, not mixing not mixing with just old football people and people who, who football is their life. Um, I've got friends who are friends with me because of me and my personality, not because of who I am. And I think that's big for me as well. Yeah. The notion that a football manager who's going through a tough time would be better off locking himself in a darkened room with no other influences and would be able to find a solution in those circumstances is clearly ludicrous. Football managers are human beings, folks, exactly. who have the whole infrastructure of life just like you and I do, and they deserve to have that release occasionally and in moderation as Gareth has just <laughs> described. Your fixtures in Skybet League One this coming weekend. These are all Saturday, three o'clock kickoffs. Two of the bottom four going head-to-head -head as Accrington take on Cambridge. Fifth place, Bolton at home to Fleetwood. Sixth place, Derby entertain Portsmouth. Oxford United, just above the relegation zone, got their first league win in 18 matches. They've been on their worst winless run since the late 1980s is midweek as they head to Forest Green. I'm rather relieved about that. I'm hosting their end of season dinner this coming weekend. <laughs> and that was said to be a challenge to say the least. So, um, I mean, no offence to the opposition that Oxford beat, but um, my evening may get slightly easier. Congratulations to Ipswich, 12 league wins in 13. If they beat Exeter, they are back in the championship. MK Dons, two points above the relegation zone, entertain fourth place. Barnsley, Morecambe are the team just below MK Dons. Two consecutive wins after 10 without there at home to Lincoln. Peterborough, two points off the playoffs, entertain Bristol Rovers. Congrats as well to Plymouth, who know if they beat Burton, they will be back in the second tier for the first time since 2009-10. Sheffield Wednesday have won three of their last four are at Shrewsbury. Uh, those two managers, Stephen Schumacher and Kieran McKenna, yeah. uh, just, I mean, you've been there, you've, you, you know, with your, your promotions, you're so close. All you know, all you have to do is keep on keeping on, and yet that prize is so far away. Yeah, I mean, you you must be thinking about the field of all possibilities, guys. Yeah, uh, anyone who says they totally just focus on what they're doing, honestly, it, it's just not possible. It's not possible. You know all the permutations. You know what can happen. And uh, I remember our, our promotion from two to one at Chesterfield. Um, I had, I have the scores constantly coming at me all game. You know what I mean? It's un, it's it's impossible not to have them. You know, and, and and so yes, focus on what you're doing. But you know, it's over forty six games. You know, it's not this one game that counts. You've done so well, and you've done so much to get here. You know, you might get a helping hand here and there. But um, as you say, those two guys. You know, I think for me, well, the both of them aren't they? Because Schumacher has done it when everyone else thought he'd fall away, especially when they lost Cooper. You know, the keeper, he's been phenomenal this season. You know, they lost him. 100%, yeah. yeah. I think he's, everyone's been saying, they'll fall away, they'll fall away. That must have been horrible to to contend with. Everyone believing you'll fall away, but you've still done it. So fair play to Stephen. And then Kieran, who's, you know, let's be honest, has spent quite a bit of money, more than a lot, but justifiably now. You know, he's up there and uh, I feel for Darren Moore because he's done a hell of a job. You know, they've got maybe 90 points is it right? and and they still, they still may not get promoted and it's uh it's 
is it 90 or 80? I can't remember now. But yeah, as things stand then, and everybody's played 44 games now, we've got Plymouth on 95, then Ipswich on 94, then there's a four-point gap to Sheffield on 90, Barnsley 90 on 85. Points. I mean, 90 points. And, and two games to go, and you might not get promoted. That That, that is insane, honestly. Yeah, but... Consistency has been the word. Sheffield Wednesday with their club record on beat and run. However yeah. much money Ipswich have spent, if they manage to achieve 13 wins in 14 matches with one to go, I mean, that doesn't happen often. And oh. as you quite rightly say, I just keep looking at Stevie Schumacher and, and sometimes they get themselves in a fix with 10 minutes to go in a game and I, my, my head goes, yeah, this, this, this is the one where <laughs> some of us really cynics well. are thinking. And then, and then you know, I find myself having to text him to say, your team are like a dog with a bone. You will, and another dog, bigger dog down the road is trying to nick it off the little chihuahua and it's just got its gnashes stuck into the marrow and is sucking the living daylights out of it. And it's it's in their house like that and they can't actually get the horn out and they just suck it and hang on to it. Phenomenal. Of course, it's not over yet. Not and yet. I have used the word congratulations with regard to those two teams. I mean it in the context of one more win will get you over the line. We might see changes yet. Skybet League 2 fixtures this coming weekend. Carlisle in fifth v Salford in sixth. That could be a playoff game in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Time Crawley need a point to assure their safety as they take on Walsall. Commiserations to Hartlepool. Uh, two seasons back from the National League, but looking ominously as though they will be heading down into the fifth tier over the next couple of games. The champions, Leighton Orient, entertain Stockport, who are currently four points off an automatic promotion place. Mansfield just outside the playoff place is on goal difference, entertain Harrogate. Northampton, no. If they can beat seventh place Bradford, then they will secure League Two promotion for the third time in eight years. Stevenage 2 no a win against Grimsby will send them back up to League 1. But we must send our commiserations, Gaz, to, to Rochdale. 102 years of EFL history relegated last weekend. And I kind of look at that cluster of clubs of Macclesfield Town, Bury, Oldham Athletic, mm. now Rochdale. That is a decimation of a football well, don't, don't geography people, don't take me to task if I use the word valley. But, you know, for, in my head, they all fit in a in a little sort of that, that's where I'm run of clubs. That's where I'm from up that way, you know, and that is that is unbelievable, you know, to know that probably a couple of founders of the Football League in there as well. It's just, it's just unthinkable of what's happened. And then I look at the National League the other day, you, Scunthorpe, Yeovil and Torquay, all look like they've gone from the conference now. And that they, they're all actual league teams, you know, within 10 years, they've all been in the league. And they're, and that's just proving what, what's happening, you know, and it's, it's so tough to, to contend. Yeah, but we, on the other hand, we do embrace the new blood that comes through. People bring new methodology, people not stuck to the way stuff that was done two, three, four decades ago, half a century ago. So you see a club like, I don't know, Burton Albion, who yeah. consolidate their position in the in the second tier. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you went back quarter of a century, 30 years, you could include Wickham Wanderers in that. Yeah, so fair, yeah. it's the yeah. story of life, isn't it? Great dynasties peak and then come back down the other side, but trying to stay there nobody's got a god-given right no it's true and, and people in their 20s claim not like old fogies like me and you won't even have remembered uh an oldham or a yeovil anywhere near the league anyway they'll be thinking well they've always been down there but you know yeovil with championship and an oldham correct me if i'm wrong i think they were in the first ever premier league weren't they yeah they were yeah, they were was, and uh yeah. twice reached the fa cup semi-finals in the around that same time as well so listen I, I not in any way wishing to be unsympathetic to any club that is on hard times at the moment but I was just trying to be fair to those that had come in the opposite direction now listen just before we finish off talking about QPR we do need to talk I like a little chat about me music and you do have an album in the 
pipes, but you're kind of sitting on the release of it because you want to make it absolutely clear to people it's been recorded a little while now. You, you've not been taking time off from trying to keep QPR in the Skybet Championship, but you are looking forward to when it gets released, probably in July. Well, Saturday after the game, we can release it as long as we survive. So, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, this. So at Wickham, um, the aforementioned Cherry Red Records have, uh, have put an album together for us, 11 original songs and uh, and myself and, and the band I've always been in um, changed its name a few times, but now the Cold Blooded So Heart. Cherry Red were one of the sponsors at Wickham Wanderers. Just the, the main shirt sponsor. I think they sponsor the stadium at Wimbledon as well. Very, very into their football, you know, Cherry Red Records. Uh, so they've funded the, 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 the album. Um, and, and do you know what? We finished it in... Late January, all done, all finished, all ready to go. Really getting ready, ramping up, going to release it. Wickham, yeah, it didn't matter when we released it at Wickham. Everything's gone rosy there. Playoffs would have been brilliant. Championship, fantastic. I get the QPR job. Everything goes on hold because we're, I'm in a relegation battle. Who, what kind of character releases an album while they're in a relegation battle? Not me, I tell you that. So, guitarist is going mental. He wants he wants some cash back on his uh, on his investment. The Cherry Red Records are being very good about it all, but um, honestly, the moment we can secure this uh, championship status, that's uh, that's another big thing for me. Is getting this album out, which has been finished for months but uh obviously I, I respect everyone i don't want anyone thinking i was concentrating on that and not um not getting the three points especially at stock on saturday so hopefully the cold light of day i think the album's called um well i know the album's called uh oh, i hope so it's your album i'm sure you titled it so <laughs> Listen, you don't uh, know <laughs> the words there the cold-blooded hearts and that'll be coming out soon so um hopefully it'll do well but um i know you're a big music man yourself Clem, so i will take your listening opinion very seriously when you get to listen to that Oh, my Lord, no pressure there. May, um, I mean, you, you, you've gone a long way with the way to staying up, with the way in which teams down the bottom have been taking points off each other. I guess you just want to secure safety, as you've intimated, and then you can start, A, making sure the club's not in this situation again, and B, have you got a template in mind that might see the club prosper more consistently at the other end yeah. of the Skybet Championship table? Yeah, hundred percent. Claim, you know, I've got, I've got, I've got three plans, all time based, and the short term is survive. The mid term, honestly, and I'll, I'll say this in the greatest respect to everyone, every QPR fan who thinks that we should be back in the Premier League, we need to stabilise this club. There's some, there's some things behind the scenes that need sorting out. There's, there's a lot that's, it's got just a little bit um, away from, from what this club should be for me, uh, and I aim to. With, with the help of, of Les Ferdinand, who's been nothing but support to me since I've walked in the door and, and the owners, um, I just think it just needs that little bit of uh, of identity back. And I, and I want to bring that. Uh, and there's ways to do it. There's ways I will do it. And, you know, it might not be popular with everyone, but I'm going to do this because this is the way I believe it should be done. Um, and I had a great grounding at Wickham. Nothing like QPR. I know that. But I think the running of a club can be similar, just on a bigger scale. And then long term... I want to get this club touching, and not just just this club. I want to have a go. <laughs> I want to get to the the right end of the championship and start going right. This Premier League, this Golden Fleece that everyone talks about, is it possible? Is it possible for a club like QPR to get back there? Because at the moment, it seems like a, a million miles away. And if I was a foreign manager, maybe I'll have a chance of managing the Premier League. But the only way I think I can ever manage in the Premier League is by taking a team up into the Premier League. And I'd love to do that one day with QPR. A lot of work to do first. Firstly, let's stay in the Championship. As always, we appreciate your honesty. Thanks for joining us on the Official EFL podcast. Thanks, Clem. Really, real pleasure to talk to you. Always, mate. And you've always been a great support, so thank you. The Official EFL podcast with Mark Clement. Last weekend, the 2023 annual EFL Awards took place. They recognise outstanding achievements amongst the players, managers and staff across the Football League 72 clubs. We're going to hear now from some of the winners, starting with Middlesbrough's Tuba Akpom, who was asked what it felt like to be named Championship Player of the Season. You know, beginning of the season, I wasn't sure what I was doing here and then um, I started playing, I got injured, missed seven games and that was difficult as well. So, um, yeah, ever since ever since I come back um, from injury, I've just tried to push as hard as I can 
and um, the gaffer's come in at the perfect timing and he's just taken my game to another level. So I've got to say thank you to my teammates as well. I couldn't, I couldn't do it without them, you know, they've been there with me every step of the way. Little did I know it would work out like this, like um, just everything, you know, getting on the ball in a half turn, roaming around, finding the pockets. And uh, once again, I've got to say a big thank you to the gaffer because he's just let me play as I want to play and come deep and get on the ball and express myself. So it's been, it's been amazing. What a remarkable year Tuba Akpom has had. And so too the Burnley manager, Vincent Company. Here he is shortly after being named Championship Manager of the season. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous privilege, first of all. And I said the big difference between being a player and a manager is that you, you feel as a manager that you owe it even more to the people you work with, you know, players, staff, uh, family, you know. It, it's just been tough and, and I think the results have hidden a little bit the fact that it's actually been a very tough season for us, you know. Um, we've had to grind results, we've had to um, deal with the gruelling fixture list of the prim of the championship, sorry, and um, uh, and yeah, it's taken a lot of mental, mental resilience, um, stamina in our character, and and and, and, and to to be promoted, and, and and then with all the ambition to to try and be champion this season, um, it's been a special season. The awards don't just recognise this season, but also those who've left their mark on football in general. The prestigious Sir Tom Finney Award is presented to a player who's had an outstanding career and contributed an exceptional amount to the EFL. This year, it went to a man who I think it's fair to say is never short of a word or two, Adebayo Akin Fenwa, who halfway through his post-award interview was gate-crashed by the man we've just been talking to, Bears' former manager at Wickham Wanderers, Gareth Ainsworth. And it's humbling. Um, I was saying my brother got me on forced precincts. I thought I was giving out an award. And then until I saw the gaffer get up, it, then it all aligned and I realised what was happening. Um, but listen, it's humbled. And I'm sorry, I'm humbled, I'm proud, I'm honoured um, to get recognition for a career that, listen, as a five-year-old, I just wanted to play football. I wanted to score goals. I wanted to make people laugh, you know, um, and to be able to get recognition. Listen, it's humbling. I, I use this word a lot, mind-boggling. I use this word, humbling. Um, and for me, I, I think I take the, the biggest solace I take from this is I always say that I'm, I am very unapologetically myself, so I've, I've done it my way, I've done it me. Um, I always say any interaction that people have with me, I'll try and be as authentic as possible. Um, and that's where it is. Um, so, with the past... me to walk in, but he never runs out of words. I, I, right? he I, never, I, I will, ever I will runs continue out of words, talking yeah? on he that. He continues talking, I so I'm saying, Gaffer, get in there, and I'm saying, I can't, he never show up. I, the one thing I've got against him is like, at Wembley, no one remembers this, right? All the great day and all the great kind of thing. You called my boots whack. I, I don't even know what that means I, today. Listen, all right? I've said it a few more times. <laughs> they be asking like our relationship. I said the only chink in your armor is your leather jacket and your whack yeah, boots. Let's see. <laughs> At least he tells the truth. You know, it was too far to me, but we had some proper discussions in oh, the office. You know, I remember yeah, 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 some yeah, great yeah. discussions. Listen, so. when you're talking about. For me, it couldn't have been any perfect. It couldn't have been, the stars couldn't have lined any better for this man to give me this award. Um, I was lucky enough, and I'll say this, I was lucky enough to, to work under his tut tutelage. That's a big boy word. I thought, oh, yeah, it's a big boy word, yeah? Say so nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a pundit now. I'm a pundit now. Um, but no, nah, listen, all jokes aside, um, we was meant to, our faith is strong, and we was meant to work. We played against each other, and we was meant to work together, and what we achieved. There's always that respect, but yeah. hey, what I learned, even I didn't realise it would be that good. I, right? I, so, you know, yeah, wow, I, 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 thought I'd have, I thought I'd have two good years with him. He got four extra on that, <laughs> yeah. so that was six years. That was a two-hour um, drive from South London every I'm day. I'm telling well, you, yeah. not many people can make me do that. Monday's off, that yeah. was the secret, all right? He, he did move training back <laughs> half an hour for me as well, so he, he was very accommodating. Hey, congrats. But no, um, I'm blessed, and thank you, man. Brilliant, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for this as well, thank you. And finally, can there be a more fitting recipient of this year's outstanding contribution to League Football Awards than the ever popular Chris Kamara, who has asked what the EFL means to him? Well, it's where I started my football, you know, at Portsmouth 74, 75 season. Um, great, you know, I continued. Obviously, I played Premier League for a few years, but 
ended up back in the EFL with Bradford and uh, yeah, I wouldn't change anything for the world. I can't believe the trophies that are coming my way at the moment. It's, you know, not sure I deserve them, but thank you for everyone who keeps giving me them because it's, you know, uh, I'm still shaking, yeah. And it goes without saying our congratulations to Cammy on his wonderful legacy. If you'd like to see a full list of winners of the 2023 EFL Awards, it's at www.efl.com. The official EFL podcast with Mark Clint. Just in case it has escaped your attention, 15 years to the day since a 2-0 defeat at Hereford committed Wrexham to the same number of seasons in the National League, they are back to much Hollywood razzmatazz and thanks to the 47 goals, 38 in the league this season of Paul Mullen. Do you know what? Do you know what I love? I mean, I love loads of aspects of this story, Paul, but then I kind of look at Morecambe, Swindon, Tranmere, Cambridge United. And then suddenly you just, I mean, it's been a life changer for you, hasn't it? What's everything that's happened at Wrexham? Um, not so much my life has changed. My life's very much the same. It's just what I enjoy most, still sitting on the couch with me little lab. But I suppose the um, whole attention and the uh, media spotlight and pressure, I suppose, um, has all been ramped up by a thousand times, I suppose, but uh, my life hasn't changed. I just like take try and take to it like a duck to water and just uh, take the punches as they come and roll with it. Yeah, well, you've you, you've hinted at some of the downsides there. I mean, the very fact that there is constantly a camera being stuck in your face, the world is talking about this football club that that has put extra pressure on you guys as players has it because that goal hole suggests you just do what you love doing which is putting the ball in the back of the net yeah obviously it's a great thing for the club and even for us as individuals to have the attention we've received this year and obviously if you're not playing well that attention isn't going to come so first and foremost you have to play well in order to achieve it but yeah that's out of pressure obviously everybody's talking about us every day it's on the news and no more than myself it's been FA Cup games of been around me and speaking about me, which puts added pressure going into those games. And then you've obviously got everyone saying, oh, are they going to do it? Are they going to fall away? Like, is the pressure going to get to them? And obviously the owners being the owners, they like to build up a bit of suspense. So they'll be tweeting, oh, like the top of the league, things like that. Obviously, of course, and that's loads of pressure, but not more so than the fans. You know, they've been out of the league 15 years and they're coming the game wanting to win, wanting to get promoted so badly that sometimes you can feel the nerves coming off them while you're playing. And that wasn't the case on the last day of this, in the last game when we won the league. You know, we went one down after 30 seconds and the whole stadium's erupted in voice and singing for us, telling us we're going to win the league. And obviously in the end that night we managed to repay them. But I think pressure's a good thing. If you don't have pressure in your job, then you're not doing the right job or you're not doing it correctly. So uh, it's something that we enjoy doing working under the pressure but as I say if it was a if it was a choice to have less pressure and do the same job obviously some people would like that but I prefer it the other way because if you've got pressure then you're doing something right. Has the has the glamour in any way changed your perceptions of yourself? No not at all I'm just me stick to being me and what you, what you see is what you get. That's just me as a person. And I don't think I'd ever change for anything. Obviously, it becomes a little bit strange at first getting used to when you walk into a shop or a supermarket or to walk into a shop in the town centre to get something for the baby and people ask for photos and things. But I'm privileged that someone had asked me for a photo. At first, you stand back and you're like, me? Like, why, why would you want a photo with me? But obviously, with everything that's gone on at the club after the documentary and all the success we've had this season and playing as well as they have done, then that, that's only going to be natural. And I just, um, to be honest, I should be privileged to be in that position. Yeah. I have have there been any kind of loggerhead moments where you've got the, the kind of traditional football world of, say, Phil Parkinson and you guys, and then suddenly, you know, you turn up one day and there's 
film crew wandering about in intrusive places. I mean, have there been moments where both parties have had to compromise? Has there been any kind of little battles along the way? I think in one of the episodes of Welcome to Wrexham I watched, somebody went, oh, for goodness sake, I, I think it was the physio, I can't, do, you know, I can't do what I need to do and stuff like that. Has there been a meeting of minds somewhere in the middle? Yeah, that was Kev. He's the uh, head of performance. But as I say, he wants everything done properly. His job is basically to make as sure... He should, as he should, Paul. Yeah, as he should. Exactly. He, it's his job to get us in prime condition to play the games. And if he feels something's going to get in the way of that, then he's got every right to voice his uh, concerns. But as I say, there's a lot of things that happen, but we get used to it as players. We roll with it. But I would like to say the gaffer has been unbelievable in dealing with it. Like The stuff he has had to deal with. There was a time this season when the King came to visit the stadium the day before a longer way trip to Eastleigh. And obviously the, the lad's done that. And the gaffer would much prefer to just go treat the game as usual. But he, he's so good at dealing with those situations and uh, helping the lads out with it as well and try to make everything as seamless as possible. That's no problem. We'll just do that, lads, and we'll uh, then be on our way. And I think we've all hand- handled that unbelievably. I think that's what I'm most proud about the lads and myself is everything that's gone on at the club. We haven't let it affect us and it's only made us perform better. And obviously that's thanks to Kev, as you say there, making sure everything's done right, but the gaffer also because he's... Kept us all knowing that the main job is uh, on the football pitch. He looked very emotional, did the gaffer. I don't know if you've watched any of the footage back, but he he looked very emotional in the immediate aftermath of the final whistle and the initial celebrations. He also looked absolutely exhausted and and knackered. I mean, is is that something you've all felt when you know you've done it? The body just subconsciously starts to relax. Yeah, I think when the whole stadium's emotional, it's hard for you as an individual not to become emotional. I was, I was myself to, to see the happiness on people's faces. What we'd just given them is something that you, you can't buy anywhere. And obviously being the manager of the team, the one leading us, he, he fears that even more so, more so. The gaffer lives around the Wrexham area, so he sees fans every day. And we knew what it meant to them, never mind the pressure from elsewhere. That, that's all normal in football. But we knew what it meant to the people of Wrexham to get promoted and to be able to deliver them. It was emotional. And as I say, you see the smiles and happiness on the face, the tears in their eyes as they're celebrating that they wanted this moment for so long. And we were the people to be able to give them that. Like It, it, it was unbelievable. Yeah, we we have managed to get through about six and a half minutes of this chat without mentioning the names of Rob. I'm going to go from Meckel Henny. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, good. And Ryan Reynolds, obviously. I mean, even from afar, are they constantly interacting with you? You know, are they? You'll be in the middle of eating your dinner one night, and there'll be something drops, a little bit of encouragement or some sort of message from one of them or the other? Yeah, they genuinely care. Like, it's not a facade. It's not fake for the television. It, it's nothing like that. It's genuinely, they are the most genuine owners I've ever seen at a football club. As I say, they'll text and ask how the family are. They'll ask how you are. They'll ask how you're feeling going into the next game and general chit-chat also just... To keep in touch and obviously they understand that they need to, well, they feel that they need to be accessible to the players and be able to um, communicate with them. Because as I say, them being big superstars at first, sometimes people may be overawed by it or whatever, but they make everything and make you feel so comfortable that it's just not a problem. It's just, they are like a human being, like everybody else, but people perceive them differently and they're not. And it's just the most genuine people ever who have been really successful and they want to be successful in this venture as well. So they're going to give it everything they've got to ensure that happens. And as I say, if that's keeping in touch with the lads to get the best out of them, then brilliant. But I think they do it because they genuinely care how people are. Paul, were you were you a little bit cynical at first? I mean, you know, respectful and honoured to be approached to join the club, but were you a little bit mm, not sure about this and they kind of had to win you over in those initial negotiations and discussions? No, they had to win me over in terms of what the plans were with the club. I had to buy into that. I had to believe what they were telling me and every single thing they promised me and told me they, they've stuck to, which has obviously been unbelievable, but... When I signed for the club, I said at the time, first interview, I wanted to be excited going into work every day. And still to this day, two years later, I can't wait to go in. I've had a couple of days off after winning the league. I can't wait to get back and see what happens next week. It's unbelievable. I absolutely love it. 
obviously I want to play as high as I can in football as it like anyone does but when this opportunity arose last time it was the best for me as a, as a family man who wants to be close to home and be near his son every night it was the it was the perfect solution for me rather than moving away to play in higher leagues I, I care more about my son than that but obviously I'd love to play as high as possible in my time in football and if that's at Wrexham then unbelievable it, it, it honestly is the best club I've ever been at yeah I mean listen you've had highs in your playing career before but it just feels on this occasion you've just kind of you've relit a whole community it almost feels like it's transcended you know 46 games of 90 minutes it's it just seems to have permeated out across a much wider area of north wales yeah obviously the documentaries raised the profile of the club enormously but if we're not kidding ourselves, this club had 20,000 fans years ago coming to watch games when the videos of the cop that was was built at the time is full, the whole stadium's full. They've never been short of spectators and fans who really get behind the club. They just needed that little help being reintegrated to the club in terms of the feeling they have for it. Obviously, when the old owner was in and he was asset stripping the club, then why are the fans going to go and give them money for him to take out of it? It ain't going to work like that. Obviously, when everyone's excited, it's going to be a lot easier to sell the place out. But the club's got so much support and always has done. And now everyone just keeps adding to that. And it's impossible to get tickets. And that's down to the people of Wrexham. Because the people who do come over, they can't get them. It's, a, it's an unbelievable club, as I say. It's special. And to give them that moment on Saturday night was uh, what I've worked for for two years. And uh, oh, I was taken back by it, to be honest. The support I've had has been phenomenal. Listen, I know you, you you love being with the wee man. You've already mentioned that in the course of the interview, but a little bit of a celebration with the boys on Saturday night before you started to do the family celebrations, or was it a lot longer with the with the team? Did it get messy? Were you all still up and on no, Sunday it morning? Messy. It was unbelievable, to be fair. We had a great night. We had the families all together afterwards with the players and obviously the owner and the management staff and that, and we had a party at the club and... That went on till all hours. I ended up on a physio bed having a sleep for 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> it was one of the old assistant coming in singing me song. Um, so then that was the end of that. It was back to drinking a coffee and trying to sort myself out that way. But the next day we got together just as a squad, as a, a whole team, and uh, had a bite to eat and some drinks and stayed out for the whole of that day. And then I left, to be fair, before anyone else, just to get back and see the little man because I had stuff on the next day. And uh, I realised, we've luckily enough, we've still got a couple of weeks to celebrate, so uh, we're going to make the most of it and we can absolutely milk it. Yeah, is it, it, uh, are they getting you over to Hollywood or anything, rather than uh, Terra Molinos or something this, this year? Is that, are, you, are the boys going <laughs> away for a trip? I'll have to keep that a secret, I think. But, oh, uh, is it a secret? Do you know where you're going? Are, you got... They are taking us away. I'm not 100% sure where yet, though we haven't uh, booked anything, but I'm pretty sure it'll be a special occasion, no matter where we go. I love how unaffected you are just sitting chatting to you most importantly of all you're going to get a bit of a rest now once you've tidied up your football loose ends got your plan to stay in check for the summer and everything's been sorted are you going to get the the three of you away for a little bit of a break you're going to get holiday yeah absolutely you know we've got one game left this weekend and then i'll have a little bit of time celebrating the season we've just been through but i can't wait just to take the little man away in the summer i'm going to go to portugal and um Spend the, spend the most of June there and it'd be lovely just to see him relax every day and we don't have to stress about going to school and teaching him new things and we can just enjoy swimming every day, which is one of his favourite activities. So, I, I, to be honest, I've waited for that moment since the last time we went away last summer. Yeah, brilliant. And in the meantime, from August onwards, you've got life back in the EFL to look forward to, Paul. Oh, absolutely. Welcome back. It uh, took a longer year, than, uh, one year longer than I thought it was going to, but um, I'm looking forward to it. It's another challenge and uh, we want to go and give it our best in League Two as well and hopefully try to get out to that league. You know, it's not going to be easy. We've all been there before. It's a difficult league, but we're full of confidence at the minute and there's no reason why we don't believe we can go and do it again. Congratulations. Enjoy the summer. Give our love to Rob and Ryan, won't you? <laughs> Thank you, mate. Cheers. 
That is it for this episode. A big thank you to Paul Mullen, Gareth Ainsworth, and congratulations to all our EFL Award winners. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please do give us a five-star rating, press the subscribe button, and share on your socials if you'd like to get in touch. Our email address is podcast at EFL.com. That's podcast at EFL.com. I'm Mark Clement. Join us again soon for another episode of The Official EFL Podcast.